launched Lorain County's new on-demand microtransit program has seen nearly 6,000 riders in Lorain and Elyria. People are using an app or calling up on the phone to get a ride to work, the grocery store, or school, similar to rideshare apps like Uber or Lyft. It was implemented in response to residents saying there were gaps in the public transit options, and elected officials are touting the pilot program's success. Welcome to The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. Today, we'll learn more about that program with Lorain County Commissioner David Moore. Later, a conversation with Cleveland Metro Park CEO Brian Zimmerman about a new project on the shores of Lake Erie, what they're calling a world-class sailing center. We'll hear more about what the center entails and who it will serve. Finally, our arts and culture reporter tells us about the live theater productions you can enjoy this fall. Those conversations coming up first, the news. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Corva Coleman. Florida authorities are holding a suspect wanted in yesterday's apparent assassination attempt against former President Donald Trump. Florida prosecutors say they're preparing a warrant. NPR's Franco Ordonez reports the incident happened at Trump's Florida golf course. The apparent attempted assassination comes just two months after Trump survived another attempt on his life. Secret Service opened fire on the suspected gunman when they noticed the muzzle of a rifle poking through some shrubbery that lines the course. The Republican nominee, Donald Trump, was about 400 yards away. President Biden said in a statement that there is no place for political violence in the country. NPR's Franco Ordonez reporting. Ohio Republican Senator J.D. Vance is standing by his falsehoods that Haitian migrants were eating pets in Springfield, Ohio. The lie has been rejected as, quote, garbage by Ohio Republican Governor Mike DeWine. Municipal buildings and public schools have been closed because of threats. Today, two colleges in Springfield have moved all classes online because of bombing and shooting threats. And Pierce Luke Garrett reports. The Republican candidate for vice president defended his words about Haitian migrants. The evidence is the first-hand account of my constituents who are telling me that this happened. Springfield officials say there is no evidence of Haitian residents eating pets. When asked about this by CNN's Dana Bash, Vance said, if I have to, but it if wasn't I just have a to meme, create sorry. stories so that the American media actually pays attention to the suffering of the American people, then that's what I'm going to do, Dan. Vance says the town has been overwhelmed by migrants. But since Vance and Trump made these false claims and spread them on social media, local officials say it has also received numerous bomb threats. Luke Garrett. NPR News. The Justice Department and the video sharing app TikTok will be in federal court today. They're arguing over a law that could effectively ban the app in the U.S. by January. NPR's Bobby Allen reports. It's seen as perhaps TikTok's last hope convincing a federal appeals court that banning the app used by as many as half of Americans is a free speech violation. The Justice Department will be defending the law Congress overwhelmingly passed that considers China-owned TikTok to be a national security threat. The law gives TikTok's parent company until January 19th to sell or be put out of business in America. TikTok says forcing it to divest from Beijing-based ByteDance is unconstitutional and technologically not feasible. Justice Department lawyers have asked for a ruling by December. Whatever is decided, the matter could be appealed to the Supreme Court. Bobby Allen, NPR News. It's raining pretty hard on parts of the North and South Carolina coasts this morning. There are tropical storm warnings up for the region. It's being pelted by a tropical system that the National Hurricane Center says does not yet have all the characteristics of a tropical storm. That could happen later today. This is NPR. Local news now from WKSU Ideastream Public Media. I'm Josh Boos. Bernie Marino, the Trump-backed Republican candidate for U.S. Senate in Ohio, visited Springfield this weekend. Marino says he believes it is a, quote, total disgrace that the city is managing an influx of about 15,000 legal Haitian immigrants. He's encouraging their eventual deportation. State House correspondent Sarah Donaldson reports. Officials say the years-long population swell has put strain on health care, road safety, and housing availability. But with Election Day close, politicians like Marino have cited Springfield as a poster child for the larger problems they see with immigration. Marino says he takes issue with the federal government providing Haitians with a short-term protective status. If you're in this country and your temporary protective status that should not have been given to you, that was given to you by corrupt politicians, you have to go. 
Moreno, a political newcomer and entrepreneur, wants to unseat longtime Democratic incumbent U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown. In an official statement Friday, Brown says he believes politicians need to lower the temperature. Sarah Donaldson at the Ohio Public Radio Statehouse News Bureau. More than 200 jobs are being cut at a Hudson company. It closes after 40 years. The Akron Beacon Journal reports Universal Screen Arts will close by the end of this year. 138 employees were let go last week. The rest will be terminated by early November. The company markets home decor, books, and gifts. Gas prices in Cleveland are down about 50 cents in the last month. GasBuddy.com reports an average of $2.94 a gallon in Cleveland, 15 cents than last week. The average in Akron is $2.82. That's down 23 cents from a week ago. And the Browns get a victory in Jacksonville with an 18-13 final. The Browns are back home on Sunday to host the New York Giants. Idea Stream Public Media, it's 9.06. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Subaru, featuring the new 2025 Forester with an updated exterior design and an 11.6-inch Starlink multimedia interface. Learn more at Subaru.com. This is NPR. It's the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. Good morning, I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for joining us, and a happy Monday to all of you. There is a common problem that exists among many communities. A person wants to use public transit, but isn't able to because the route isn't convenient for them. Maybe the bus line doesn't come close enough to their home, or there isn't a drop-off point close enough to their destination. Perhaps the transit line just doesn't run frequently enough to make it worthwhile. This is a problem that's existed in the cities of Lorraine and Elyria, and elected officials there seem to have found a solution. Lorain County started a pilot program back in July, which offers on-demand rides for a low fare in an attempt to fill in those transportation gaps. And so far, it's been deemed a success. Between July 15th and August 30th, 5,900 rides were taken. Today on our show, we're going to begin by discussing this relatively new on-demand transportation program and hear how well it's been working in Lorain and how it works. Later in the hour, we'll learn about a new sailing facility that's coming to Northeast Ohio. And to close out the program, a preview of the upcoming fall theater season with culture and arts reporter Kabir Bhatia. But first, let's talk microtransit. And with me to do that is David Moore, Lorraine County Commissioner. Commissioner, welcome to The Sound of Ideas. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, glad to have you. And if any of our listeners would like to join in the conversation, do you have concerns with public transit? Do you live in Lorraine County? And have you tried this microtransit private pilot program, please call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. So first, what are we talking about when we use the term microtransit? Well, what we're talking about is something with uh, within the Transit Authority's um, guides. Like, we oversee the whole Lorraine County. Mm-hmm. That's what we oversee. So we're looking at, um, this thing really starts out with a lot of history. Okay. You go, let's go back 20-some years ago. I actually ran for commissioner in 2001 mm-hmm. and tried to correct a lot of the problems we had in transit back then. Couldn't get people to move forward. Okay, okay? It was uh, very hard in, in government to start moving forward. I'm a business owner. That's what I am by trade. I'm not a politician. Sure. So I kind of think outside the box. Right. So I only did one term because my daughters were very young. Uh, now that they're graduated from college and moved on, we You're tackled it again. This time, with technology coming out and the success of companies like Lyft and Uber, another company called Via kind of commingled a lot of those ideas and uh, programs into a public transit system. So why don't you pause right there. Let's okay. talk about why the need was there. What were right. you hearing about from residents? Well, what, what, what was going on is they, a lot of times when it comes to government, they have a system, right? Ours transit system was a fixed base route and the wait times were two hours wow so let's say hypothetically you sit there and you miss the bus by five minutes you gotta wait another two hours there's no way that people can get to doctor's appointments get their groceries whatever they have to go whatever those needs are you can't do that with a two-hour wait time 
And so what we what we what I was looking at was okay, how do you pr- implement? At first, it was like Dialeride because I used Dialeride back in the '70s when it first came out as a as a child. You know, my parents had we had so many children they couldn't drive us everywhere. Sure. So I I, I was really uh, I really kind of support Dialeride, but what this micro transit system is, and the best way to explain it, it's like an Uber or Lyft system. You can use your app. You know, everybody can download it. If you don't, they have a system where you can call in and, and still get those rides. And so what we thought about was how the whole county has never really supported transit. Every time they've tried to pass a tax, every time they try to do something like that, it wouldn't it would fail. But our two biggest communities needed it. Sure. So that's why we looked at the pilot program for Lorraine and Elyria. Let's get them to approve and get this addicted. And that's kind of what how this thing started. So we worked with the mayors of Lorraine, um, Bradley, and uh, Elyria, Brubaker, and together between the, the different entities and ourselves and a private company, which is VIA, came in and we came up with a solution. It took us four months. This is something I've been, I knew, we knew the system wasn't working. It wasn't really helping those com- those in the community that are in need. The business community was screaming, saying, we need workers. Yeah. How can we get people to co- show up to work? How can I get my office to be a bus stop? It doesn't work on a fixed transit system. Okay, we're not. We're Why not, can't you add more stops? I'm just curious. Be, well, because you, because you have to go outside the route. Mm-hmm. So let's say that here's our route, fixed route. Okay, well let's add more stops. Now that's a three hour wait or, sure. or a two Got and it. a half hour wait. So the the uh, logistics just was not working. And you know every year doing the same thing. Oh, let's just change the route here. And it just wasn't working. So what I'm proud of is is working with VIA, working with the, the cities. We're, this is a pilot program. So working with NOACA, they said, here we go. We got money. And we have money from the federal government for this program. We jumped on it, and we can implement it in 2027. So what was the federal government's involvement? Why did they see it important enough to giving funds to Lorain County to help with getting people around? Well, I think it, it covers all the bases, economic, environmental. They're smaller buses. You don't have these huge buses driving around with one rider on it. Yeah, you know? sure. So now you have these smaller minivans that have handicap accessibility. And if, they are, if you are handicapped or disabled, they will come to your home. So, you know, there's even the micro transit system itself has not a fixed route, but a route that you may have to walk a block to or, or so we tried, you know, it's designed that way. And so it, and it, and it can it can change on the fly. For example, a doctor just outside the area says, look, at my client base economically can't afford automobiles. They, they, sure. This is perfect for my client base. Sure. And we looked at it and within two days we said, you know, what, we can change and move this in order to fit that need. And so mm-hmm. that's a cool. That's what's so cool about this. We can actually change on the fly, make it fit. Oh, and, interesting. Yeah, and it's like, got that that kind of malleability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. can move it around to address need. Yeah, and it's really what I like about it. It's almost like um, it's not like how government operates, which okay, like originally NOACA helped us with federal dollars to get so that we could implement this in 27. Well, with the ARPA dollars that we did receive, we decided that why wait? So we advance as a county, we advance those funds now. So instead of waiting until 2027, we're doing it today. Here it is 2024 and we're doing it. Now we'll get that money as the government you know, starts to fund those. We'll reimburse our general fund for that money. But what I like is what working with the cities and working with private entities, we're designing a microtransit that fits the needs of, of those looking for work, those that are looking for medical, those that are looking for groceries. Uh, to me, for a county like our size yeah. that doesn't really support one like Cuyahoga County that has a very well-run transit, they have. A, but you know what? We don't have the money for that. Sure. But this fits our budget, this fits our needs, and we don't have to go to the taxpayers and ask for more money. So uh, do you have an example? I don't know if you want to name yeah. names, but was there a specific company that had a bunch of employees that kind of hailed from a part of Lorraine County or was in a certain population that said, we need our employees to get yeah. here, but they can't afford cars? I mean, is that well, kind of well, what dictated? Well, it's not afford cars. What's going on today is workers. Just they need people that can show up on time. You ask any business owner, look, if you can just show up on time, we can train you. 
And what's going on today, what I've noticed is it's it could be people with driving issues such as DUIs. Got it. Um, it could be uh, maybe health issues they can't, or they can't afford a car. Right. And so a lot of times those are the three biggest issues. Hmm. And some of these people are saying, can you get a bus stop? Well, now what I'm hearing is, for, for example, these are companies that are, have maybe 15 to 20 employees. Yeah. Some of these maybe have 30 to 40 along the Avon, Avon Lake Corridor over there at 83. Mm-hmm. And the problem is right now is they are they they're biting at the bit right now, they want this, but we're not in that area yet. So okay. remind me again, um, and a reminder to our listeners: uh, if you have any thoughts on this micro transit program or see gaps in your area with public transit, you can call eight six six five seven eight. 0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org. And Susan and Willowick did write in and say Lake County has a very successful program with their dial a ride for places like Kirtland that doesn't have fixed right. transit. Let me, so how- we have the same thing. We have dial a ride also. But the problem is, is the time wait. The mm-hmm. time wait on micro transit when you call into the app, 10 minutes. And who's driving you know? these vans? It's county. Uh- no, not county employees, private employees. In fact, the, one, the first uh, customer. Uh, I got to inter- or interview or meet the ind- individual who was the driver. He was from Jersey, moved back to Lorraine, mm-hmm. and he worked for Via in New Jersey. Oh, and so I see. it's almost like, I don't want to say a taxi care, but these guys, the private companies hire them. Got okay? it. And so they're, they're not government employees. And so, for example, the first customer. So it really is kind of like an Uber in the sense that you are hiring to private individuals to drive these cars. Correct. And they're creating. And our fixed routes are the same way. We hired uh, another company to, to manage and run our fixed route rates. And those are all private individuals, too. And so that's how that operates. So it's the same concept, except it's more customer friendly for those that are in need. So. And, um, you know, I think sometimes when people talk about public transit and, and, and what's um, missing, they talk about that last mile. Yeah. And are you getting feedback from riders that oh. this is filling a gap or they can get a ride closer to their home and get to exactly where they need to go? Yep. You know, with uh, the way the internet is today and everyone can sure. rate your service, we're over 90% uh, approval rating right now on the service, which tells you a lot for a government agency that's only 30 to 60 days old to have that high of an approval rating on Google is is amazing. So let me ask you this. Sometimes you think of, um, you know, and this might be a stereotype, but, um, you know, do the seniors in the area, like, are they able to download the app and feel comfortable calling, you know, on the phone or using the app to get one of those rides? Yeah, well, the senior, there's actually a phone number that you can call and, Use it if you don't want to use the phone app. Sure. So it's very flexible on those people that may not be able to afford an iPhone or you know, or know how, like me, I'm technically challenged. Sure. That's why I have daughters, okay? And so basically if you are if you don't feel comfortable using the app, but I, but I can't, I don't have the stats, but it's over 93% of the people are using the app. Got and those it. Other ones are using, calling the 800 number at VIA to be... And they can manage the logistics and everything else. And it's almost the same way. You look at your, if you're doing an app, they tell you exactly where you're at on your ride, sure. where, where it's coming, and it's about to pick you up. Sure. And it's uh, it's really, I guess that's the way of the future is today. This is how we do things. These so. are the things when you think about tech ha- helping us yes. and helping the community. Um, it sounds like this is one of those areas where it's a boon and technology is actually helping the lives and even the economy of Lorain County, which is a good thing. We got a tweet from Chris who says, why is Lorain's program successful when the greater Cleveland RTA micro transit pilot was a failure? So I don't really have a good answer for that. But do you have any thoughts on, on, on why Lorraine's has, has worked so well, well I th- when maybe other jurisdictions? Yeah, I don't know what happened in Cleveland, but sure. what I've noticed is, is a lot of times in government, because I'm mm-hmm. not a career politician, sure. I'm a business owner, um, people think throwing money at a program can fix it. Okay, this wasn't like that. This was basically our mayors, our county commissioners, our and really it was it was just we're the leaders. Sure. It's those that are that are working. Those are the ones the employees that came up with this. Okay, they're the ones that were wanted this cuz they are like an, our Pam Novak's our director and she saw the need. Our director saw the need in the city of Lorraine. Their employees saw the need. How do we fix that need? And so working with uh, NOACA here in Cleveland, we're trying to say, okay, here's some pilot programs. Can we get money for it? And they said, yes, 
Okay, because they saw that they saw the the efficiencies in energy, they saw the efficiencies in management, and the efficiencies in ridership. So what what we found is maybe because Lorain County's transit system was a failure, this is making it a huge success. Versus, I, I don't really want to compare Cleveland. Sure, you know, when I used to go to these meetings twenty two years ago. You know, when I was commissioner once before, sure, and they're all talking about here's the problem. I come back, I did one term, I come back again for another term. The same discussions are being held. And sure. I said, guys, what has changed? Well, they're comparing like Lorraine County to, well, in Denmark, in Sweden, in Cleveland, in New York, Chicago. We're not those people. We right. are more rural, but we have two major urban areas. So let's focus it on a smaller scale. Sandusky also has been successful with their little micro transit. So oh, we, really? started, we started to look at that. And then VIA came in and we thought, that's it. it I like the concept of it. It's almost like a gov- it's like a business model in a government, which is usually government's not efficient. Well, yeah. this is very efficient. So our cost, what my goal is this, our budget for transit is about $5 million. I don't know what Cleveland's is, but I can tell you it's more than five. Okay. Right. So I see this as how do, we, how do we now shrink our fixed rate or fixed route? We still need those. At the same time, expand our micro transit to other areas in our county to where the jobs are, where the hospitals are, where the grocery stores are, to sure. the shops. And that's, that's what, and we've only been, we, we pulled the trigger on July 15th. So our goal is to go a year, mm-hmm. find out those costs, and then what we'll do is we'll have to go back to these communities and say, this is not free, okay, even though it's only $2 for a rider, you know, it's not free. So how are we all going to partnership financially to make this a success? Got it. So that's what we're doing. We're kind of doing, I like the concept of slow and easy, we'll win this race. And hopefully right now we're being asked by um, our, the mayor of Lorraine went to Washington, D.C. for an event. And everyone's like, this is what the future is. And he raised his hands. We're doing it now. Nice. And that was awesome just to be identified as, as cutting edge. So yeah. is that kind of the next steps? Is there thoughts about the expansion? Yes. I think you kind of mentioned it. But oh, yeah. They all, everybody wants it right now. Everybody, okay. you know, it's, this is what you want. I, don't, I, I hate to use this terminology. But it's like, let's get these communities addicted to a very successful program so that they want it. That's what I first said sure. before we did it. It's happening. Sure. I mean, I know like Oberlin is, they bought an electric bus and all, they're all, they're biting at the bit. We want to be a part of this. You know, Avon, Avon Lake, where these, there's a lot of companies along the 83 corridor, they want it. So what we got to do is like, we're only, we've only been two and a half months in and that's how successful it is when people want it. And it's that we just started. It, this is going to be an amazing, I think it's going to change and revolutionize how Northeast Ohio looks at transit. So, All right, uh, we have a, a caller on the line. This is Liz in Lorraine. Liz, good morning. Thanks for calling in. Give us your thought. Uh, this sounds wonderful, and I was curious to know whether the provider offers rides that might be across the border into a neighboring county, like, let's say, a a community near the border of Lorain County. All right. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Liz. Um, what we're, that's one of the things we're working on. You go out by North Ridgeville, Lorraine County Community College has a campus right there on the border. Mm-hmm. And within about three, 400 yards is where the RTA is on Cuyahoga mm-hmm. County. And now you're, now this is where government gets really interesting. You know, you got county commissioners in Lorraine County, Cuyahoga. Then you have the RTA, you have the uh, Lorraine County Transit, you have the other ODOT, you have all these people. And what we're working on, we've been working on this for about 18 months, is how do we connect to that RTA right across over there on uh, Lorraine Road, right? Sure. So we know where it's at. We're actually working on it because having the college campus there as one of the stops, we're very close. And so what the the game plan is to somehow come up with a fixed rate system, integrate it with our micro transit system. So you might have 10 minute wait from, let's say you're in the city of Lorraine and you want to get to RTA over there mm-hmm. by the college on, in North Ridgeville. Yeah, you might have a quick ride there, but the fixed routes might be on the hour. And so that's, that's some of the things that, and it's, you got to be really, you got to get these guys and I'm not one of them that are very good at logistics and how to calculate time right. and, and when, when are the times that you need it? Cause we've actually worked with the college where they'll say, Hey, look at, we need stops here, but 6am doesn't work. Sure. You know, so, but this is where our biggest crowds are class morning schedules, classes, exactly. afternoon classes. And, and so you're dealing with so many different types of companies and, and educational centers and hospitals and doctors. I mean, it's a lot just, of moving parts. There is, but you know what? I'm excited because we're moving forward. You know, I, re- I really am. I'm excited. So this is a good program. 
David Moore, commissioner with yeah. Lorain County. We feel your enthusiasm yeah. and excitement and um, exciting to hear that yeah. the program is going so well so far. Thanks so much for coming in. Oh, and thank you for having me. And we'll check in with you. Okay. Let's take a quick break. When we return, we're going to talk about the moves to make Northeast Ohio a world-class destination for sailing. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. You're tuned into the Sound of Ideas right here on your NPR station, WKSU, IdeaStream Public Media. Support for our programming this morning is provided by Billow Funeral Homes and Crematory, providing bereavement services and grief support to individuals and families with chapels in Cuyahoga Falls and Fairlawn. More information at BillowFuneralHomes.com. The Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, their number one event in the number two business is back. The Clean Water Fest is this Saturday. This family-friendly event has everything to learn where it goes, including trucks, science, tours, and more. Details at cleanwaterfest.com. The Original Mattress Factory, offering factory-direct, locally-made mattresses, hand-building mattresses and box springs in Cleveland since 1990, and selling them directly to customers in their own stores. Learn more at originalmattress.com. WKSU IdeaStream Public Media's end of fiscal year membership campaign starts on September 24th. We're already gearing up for an intense election, and WKSU is the source you can rely on for facts, engaging reporting, and dialogue that builds connections and mutual understanding. WKSU brings you news without noise, and we hope you will support us with a monthly sustaining membership. Just visit WKSU.org donate, and thanks. You're with the Sound of Ideas from Ideas Stream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for being with us this hour. Most of us enjoy Lake Erie through activities like going to the beach or fishing on one of the many piers or kayaking down the Cuyahoga River. But a new endeavor from the Cleveland Metro Parks, as well as several other community partners, is shining a light onto another activity sailing. News broke recently of plans for a community sailing center near the East 55th Street Marina, and that new facility has been dubbed World Class. With me to talk about this new project is Brian Zimmerman, CEO of the Cleveland Metro Parks. Brian, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you so much for having me, and, and this is just a, another amazing opportunity to reconnect or connect for the first time to our lakefront. Yeah, I love that. And if any of you want to participate in the conversation, have questions or thoughts about adding a sailing center through Cleveland Metro Parks onto the shores of Lake Erie, give us a call, 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. So, Brian, first I want to know, why sailing? Why was that even thought of? Um, from the Cleveland Metro Parks as uh, a sport and activity that you all wanted to tackle? I think there's a number of ways to answer that question. Sure. Back in 2010, when I was recruited, actually 2009, 2010, so 14 plus years ago, sure. recruited to Cleveland. One of the things that um, Milwaukee prided itself on was having a lot of access to Lake Michigan. And one of them was uh, a community sailing center. And having arrived in Cleveland, there were a number of things that we needed to do to kind of get our house in order. And um, we partnered with the uh, state of Ohio, the Department of Natural Resources, state parks, and we were able to transition back into local control. And they had done a nice job doing a lot of investment the last few years may be lacking in maintenance a little, and we improve those things. So when you look at the beach house, well, you can even start even on the other side of town. You look at the nursery, the playground, the beach house, the Wendy Park Bridge, the trail connection. Then you flip to the other side, the partnership with the county and the city and a host of others, um, making East 9th, East 55th. So we're making this a more livable, walkable. When you think about the sailing center, it really ties very well back into um, the mantra of how do we connect to our waterfronts, whether you had mentioned the Cuyahoga River, whether it's the rowing, the Cleveland Rowing Foundation, um, when you look at the Foundry, which is our strong partner, these are amazing opportunities. But sailing was this very unique thing, and we were able to find ways to do programmatic elements through our outdoor experiences and the group at the Foundry. 
every one of the classes kept filling up, so it became a capacity issue. Wow. So we were at the Coast Guard station, uh, and we just kept building programs, and the boats kept filling, and then high schools kept coming, and so it just started to move this thing forward. So this has been going on for the last four, five, six, seven years. Now all of a sudden you look at, we have a capacity issue, we can't take on more, it's like, what are we going to do? We originally looked at building it over onto uh, Wendy Park Whiskey Island. The Coast Guard Station, the Causeway. So the Army Corps of Engineers is rebuilding that at their cost for $10 million. So that's why access to the Coast Guard Station isn't very, it's, it's, you can't get there right now. The beauty of that, though, is we're going to partner with them to actually bring electric and water. There's no amenities out. There's no utilities out there. So sure. we'll be able to oh, wow. add those, and then we'll be able to complement complement some of the other programs. Meanwhile, back as we were working through this, it's like, what does it mean? And where do we need this? And we started looking at East 55th and it was just like, wow, this is the place to land. So I know that the project will be two new buildings making up the Patrick S. Parker Community Sailing Center. Um, as you said, in the marina, what will the center look like? What, what, what will it include? We really think about it um, as a campus feel. And one, we want to be very mindful to the boaters that have used our marina for many, many years. And there's a lot of memories and there's a lot of activity. But this is really about expanding the campus. How does this campus grow? So we have a fuel dock there. We have a restaurant there. We have a viewing deck there. So there are a lot of different things. But the primary focus will be to teach people about how to connect with the waterfront. The challenge most people have is they don't have a boat. They may, sure. they want to, I want to go on the water, but I can't get access to a boat. And so this community sailing center is to have boats. You complete a level of programs and then you have an opportunity to get out. There are so many people that have sailboats that would love to have people that have an idea of how to, you know, uh, pull the mast up or how to tack over or how to, you know, pull the ropes or how to dock or all those things. And if you don't have the opportunity to, so this is about opportunities to create ex access to the lakefront. And is that a part of kind of the vision for Northeast Ohio and Cleveland is is to add things to do that are exciting and uses the natural resources? Um, so I was telling you before the show, I went sailing on Lake Erie for the first time probably a month and a half ago. Um, and it was, you know, it totally changed my perspective of the cityscape. Um, it's a really interesting way to relate to downtown, um, to be on that water. It was really invigorating. My kids had a blast. Uh, and I and it kind of added new a new dimension to my experience of living in Northeast Ohio. So your commentary right there is exactly why we're doing it. Because there are so many people that say, I can see it, but I can't touch it. I can't get to it. And I can't get on it. And if you can't get on it, you don't have that level of appreciation. The city of Cleveland is this amazing, dynamic city. When you look at all of the wonderful things we have between rock halls, science centers, um, our world-class museum, orchestra, parks, zoos. I mean, there are so many amazing things. But the waterfront arguably could be one of our greatest assets that may have this mantra of being underutilized or sure. not connected to. And so when you look at this opportunity to build something that says community, community, you belong here. Too often people have say, well, this is for the private, this is for the wealthy. This is the exact opposite of that. This so is Tell me how, because I do think I was joking around that when uh, when I was doing a tease with Josh Bush earlier about this segment, I was <laughs> we were saying when you think of sailing, you think of the Kennedys and, and people who can afford these really gorgeous boats. But it does seem a little out of touch. Yeah, and for, I think that's the thing that we've been working to dispel. When you okay. look at the 22 million visitors that come to Cleveland Metro Parks, it says you are welcome. You are welcome to come here. And so we have so many free activities through our outdoor experiences, how we connect people with nature. Our goal is to connect people to the waterfront. Mm -hmm. And this Patrick S. Parker, I mean, the theory behind um, community, community is place. And when you look at um, what the freeway system did, what the railroad system did, they cut us off. Um, when you look at people that can see it but can't get to it. So we are working to break the barriers down and use the word community. You belong here. You see yourself here and how to get under the water. So let's talk about the Foundry's involvement. What is the Foundry and how is it about getting kids involved in learning how to sail? Well, the, the family, Mike and Gina Troubleclock, I, I can't say enough good things about what they have given back to this community. And they um, had kids that were involved and they took it to a whole nother level okay. and they it, it, it dates back you know the Cleveland Rowing Foundation and the work they've did around the Columbus Peninsula they brought you know they've been um, rowing on the river for quite a number of years and in, in some very rudimentary you know facilities 
expanded, moved, grew. Then you see these teams, I mean, whether it's St. Ignatius, St. Edwards, Magnificat, the colleges. Now all of you, you see these stacking effects of people getting access to the water. If you go down there on a Wednesday night, there is a level of activity that is like unseen and unparalleled. And if you can row on this river, you can row anywhere in the country. The amount of scholarships and opportunity, the tanks, the foundry is really the basis. When you look at how and what they do, this is really the, the basis of where this program is going. Now they're going to work on the programmatic elements. We have some tie-ins, again, Metro Parks were doing adult sailing classes for quite a number of years. They would sell out within near minutes, mere minutes. Mm. And so now we're working on what are the next programs? How do we do and, and where do we go from here? So it really seems to me in talking to you that this isn't just a, hey, for people who don't think about sailing, we're going to teach you sailing. There's been a need and there's been an appetite that has been met, uh, but kind of a natural uh, chance to grow that. For sure. And, and when we looked at the limitations of what the Coast Guard station was actually giving us, I mean, again, no utilities. They had solar out there to power the radios. And right. it wasn't necessarily, it was working and it was growing, but it got to a certain point where um, that was kind of capped. And so this is that next level. And when you look at the classrooms and the space that we're trying to do, we are going to, again, put in a world-class facility. Our teams have traveled um, to multiple locations throughout the country. Um, our staff, Ryan Danker, Sean McDermott, they've, they've looked at um, this from so many different angles. And I will tell you, 117,000 cars drive by there every single day. Mm -hmm. And it's really the facility that's currently there, kind of hidden, kind of, uh, you know, non-inspiring. And we really um, put glass so you could see yourself inside the building. You could see, you know, a map going up all these things are tied back to the patrick s parker community sailing center so let's ask a, a, a question about safety because the lake can be problematic for those um, accidents have happened people who can't really swim but want to enjoy the lake uh, so how is safety being put on the floor well it's the first and foremost i mean it's one of the things that i think that the communities in general are challenged with in many different ways. The American Red Cross, the Boys and Girls Clubs, there are so many different ways that people can get access to swimming lessons. The city of Cleveland has so many unique pool opportunities. Collinwood Rec Center, how um, how do you get yourself there? And I, and I can tell you a number of different stories of um, individuals that just you know had a fear of water and they took one step, then they took another, then they took a class and now they're leading the class. And mm. so if you don't see people like you there, it's hard to imagine yourself there. And so our goal is to continue to grow the programmatic elements in all different levels. Partners like the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Foundation, um, the uh, St. Clair Superior, we are really working to bring the community into it. But yes, yeah, safety has to be on the first and foremost. And if anytime you go on the water, you need to be prepared. Life jacket, whistles. I mean, there's a whole protocol. The U.S. Coast Guard Station here, they're nothing but fantastic to do vessel checks and really work with you to be safe on the water. So what are next steps and when might the public see this finalized finished sailing center? So we're looking at breaking ground here within the next, I would say, six months. Um, you know, part of the, the process is, as you mentioned, it's a campus feel. So we may do uh, the west side first and then pull in the east side. Part of the process is we really want to make sure that the community comes along with this. So there's some elements of engagement that we'll be doing in the different neighborhoods to really um, hear from the residents as well and put those final touches on how the building will flow and what it will look like. So there's a wonderful opportunity to connect with that. So that'll be part of ClevelandMetroParks.com. You'll find the sailing center. We can uh, communicate that way. Um, and then it's really um, this next process of being able to take the, the current building down because that's where the new building will go. So it'll be out of service a little bit. So that's why we're thinking from a staging standpoint, maybe the first building goes up where there's nothing right now. So we can start doing the programming and grow and then add this other side. And then my understanding is that there are other Metro Park projects that might be connected with the sailing center. Well, there's all sorts of projects along the lakefront. When you look at um, the Hornblower's Boat, um, which most people remember, it used to be um, Hornblower's Restaurant, then Lean Dog. We moved that over to our um, facility over at Villa Angela, Euclid, and Wildwood. Um, Western Reserve Land Conservancy has most recently bought out um, the manufactured home trailer park that's there. We'll be looking at a unification of the green space there, but then adding another element of connecting to the waterfront there um, through uh, a STEM classroom type of opportunity 
opportunity. Mm. So there's more opportunities to connect. So again, you look at all the way from Huntington and, and you look at Edgewater. I mean, you just talk about this, these lily pad effects all the way across our coastal um, shoreline here. And then the trails that we're trying to make sure that people can bike there. Can you imagine being able to bike from Little Italy all the way down to the Stadium District or the Rock and Roll Hall of right. Fame? Right. That's that sounds exciting. Okay, so while we have you, we have to talk about the new primate forest project at the zoo. Um, there's a lot of talk about that. There are people who are also mourning the the rainforest uh, going away. So, kind of tell us what's been going on behind the scenes to actualize this new primate forest project. You know, I think there's there's so much nostalgia and history in Cleveland, and people get attached to things. Sure. Um, the Jake Progressive Field municipal stadium cleveland brown so the rainforest is one of those things where so many families have grown up over time the challenge is, is that at some point in time you need to do a refresh it's like putting new carpet in or putting new windows in sure. or putting a new furnace in so all of those things we've been doing along the way the new dome went on uh, almost four years ago which is hard to believe and it takes this long to build out um, this example of the primate forest so partners at cross country mortgage i can't speak uh, more highly of a group of individuals that came forward under ron leonard's leadership to be able to bring this to reality so the the new front entrance the unification one of the challenges we had when i got here was um how you actually access the zoo and you were just there and you know you have to walk through where traffic goes and so our goal is to modify that and then bring on this world-class exhibit so a few years ago we had you know some females and and one male and now we have three young very rambunctious baby gorillas and so when we look at where where the space is complementary and it's very interesting the studies and the research shows people want to see less animals and better space and so we have been working very hard when you look at african elephant crossing the rhino daniel maltz rhino exhibit you look at the giraffes you look at the things that we've been trying to do to make the yards better and more compatible well this is the greatest example of that primate forest our partners at cleveland zoological society are raising the last bit of funds that we need this will be a dramatic change our zoo will turn 150 in a few years the sesquicentennial and this will be the capstone of one of the biggest projects that we'll ever take on and uh what will be will it just be kind of an observation center or will there be research how 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 will you implement it you know it's interesting research is ongoing every day they're always doing behavioral they our docents our volunteers are really second to none across the country the amount of information if you want to know anything about all you have to do is stand there for just a little bit find the people in the blue shirts and you'll hear what's going on on any given day so research will be a component of it but it's really when we talk about primate forest the mini forest concepts they're the really the health the health of our environment so it'll be focused mm-hmm. on the tree you know, rainforest, um, primate forest. It's about the ecosystem that not only we live in, but our animals live in. So um, our orangutans will be able to have an outdoor experience for the very first time. So when you come around from kind of parking your car, you'll see this open air exhibit where the orangutans will be, then the primate forest. One of the challenges I noticed when we got here, you know, five to six months out of the year, it's inclement weather. And so the rainforest is an important uh, place for people to go during the winter months. Sure. We want to extend stay time so that you'll stay three, two, three, four hours hours instead hmm. of kind of turning coming in and out during the winter you know four or five hundred people come but most people end up in the rainforest so our goal is to return that and have longer stay times take your coat off stay hang out watch the animals um, be part of it be integrated into it all right uh, we have Ryan from Cleveland on the phone Ryan thanks for calling go ahead hi there uh, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Z- Mr. Zimmerman uh, if the sailing center is going to have Coast Guard Uh, licensed captains there to take people out on the water so the question is on on how we will be setting up who will be on the boats there'll be a whole set of protocols that will go through not only the foundry process but the metro parks process um, where the you know the licensures that people have you know our lc2 has licensed captains we have to go through annual inspections and so you know again safety will be at the utmost of our our concern um, and how we set those things up you know sometimes uh, community members have boats on on mooring balls and they can take people out so this process will be evolved as we go into it in the next year or two so ryan are you still on yeah are you a sailor are you someone who aspires or wants to learn to sail i'm just curious i am a sailor i'm actually a sailing instructor in cleveland and i am a coast guard licensed captain oh (laughs) Uh, and it took me a long time to get my license and um i want to be i want to be part of that sailing center and i i want to um make sure that this sailing center is 
is as successful as possible. So I'd love to be part of it. I can only say thank you. I mean, it's the amount of overwhelming support. It's like, it's about time. It's our opportunity. It's our next level. And Ryan, I, I can't thank you enough. It's this opportunity for people to kind of give back to a sport that they love um, and be able to teach others and bring them along for their love of water. All right, Ryan, and maybe you can uh, get connected with the Cleveland Metro Parks and see if you can be a part of its future. That's exciting. Ryan Zimmerman, CEO of the Cleveland Metro Parks. Great to see you. Thanks Thank for all the info. Thank you for exciting having me. Exciting new projects. Uh, we will be waiting with bated breath for that primate forest to open up. So thanks so much, and we will see you soon, I'm sure. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about theater live productions available to you this fall with our own Kabir Bhatia. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. Forty-four. You're tuned into the Sound of Ideas right here on WKSU Idea Stream Public Media. Support for our programming this morning is provided by Live Nation presenting Vampire Weekend with special guest Cults Thursday, September nineteenth at Blossom Music Center. Tickets available at LiveNation.com. The Cleveland Orchestra. Yafim Bronfman joins the Cleveland Orchestra for Rachmaninoff's Third Piano Concerto, September twenty-sixth through the 29th at Severance. Tickets at clevelandorchestra.com. Playhouse Square, presenting the Neil Diamond musical, A Beautiful Noise. The uplifting true story, featuring all the classic hit songs from his Grammy award-winning career. A Beautiful Noise runs October 8th through 27th. Tickets at playhousequare.org. It's the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for spending this hour with us. If summer is the time for festivals and outdoor music, fall is the perfect opportunity to bundle up and enjoy some live theater. Northeast Ohio stages are alive from Cleveland to Akron, Lorraine to Youngstown, Mansfield to Canton. Ideastream's Kabir Bhatia has compiled a list. You're so good at that. Hold and on. is here to tell us about all the live theater fall productions mm -hmm. that we can enjoy Kabir, great to see yeah, you. Have you been on the you. set yet? I've been on the set, but not with you. So okay. this is exciting. So it's extra special. It's extra special. Now finally the uh, the captain is in charge, as they say. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Uh, so tell us the scoop about yes. uh, this list of live productions. Are there many? There's many. Uh, in fact, compiling the list was a little difficult. So right away, I have to apologize to um, student theater troops. You know, okay. there's such great theater at Baldwin Wallace, University of Akron, Kent State, everywhere. Um, we weren't able to include them. Okay. We, improv. There's so much improv here in Northeast Ohio, people don't realize. Stand-up comedy. We weren't able to include all of those. People are thinking, well, tell us what is on the list. There's sure. so much good stuff. We have so many uh, professional uh, uh, ensembles here in Northeast Ohio, even outside of Playhouse Square right here where we sit. Um, so what are really the difficult. genres that well, you did cover? We're all over here with genres. There's uh, uh, musicals. There is, uh, there's classics. There's adaptations. of People think, oh, The Wedding Singer, is that is that technically classic? The Wedding Singer is 26 years old, wow. that film. And then they've been, I feel old. <laughs> I know, right? I can remember seeing it in the theater. Uh, that's been adapted into a musical. There's jukebox musicals. We just heard a spot for uh, Neil Diamond. Yes. Uh, for that, that's, that's right here. Um, there's a Tina Turner musical, jukebox musical, which is they have Broadway in Akron down at E.J. Thomas Hall. So there's so many. And then, of course, uh, we have a lot of Shakespeare up mm -hmm. here. Um, and then we have some Halloween themed things. Uh, there's The Woman in Black. Um, that's actually going to be up here as well. So there's there's a lot happening in Northeast Ohio. Now, let's talk more about The Woman in Black. Uh, is that a Shakespearean well, adaptation? It's it's Shakespearean in its feel. It's not, of course, written by Shakespeare. It's adapted from a book by, I think, Susan Hill. But uh, there's two productions of that, actually. They're, they're competing, I guess you could wow. say. But um, they're all, I think one is in uh, Lorraine. One is from Ohio Shakespeare Festival down in Akron. So uh, those folks, uh, they put on a great show all the time. Of course, they'll have Romeo and Juliet in the spring. But currently, uh, it's the woman in black. And that's kind of getting people in the mood for uh, uh, Halloween and, and spookiness. And that's sort of thing all right so are there spooky specific 
there. Theater productions that you want to talk about? Spooky specific is the medical term. And uh, not only the woman in black, we've got uh, Baskerville, a Sherlock Holmes mystery. And okay. again, these That's might not... That's kind of fun. It is fun. I mean, all of these, you're going to have a good time. And, and a lot of them... Uh, when you think about it and you hear about it, you're like, "Well, is that is that really Halloween themed?" But it's it's spooky, it's mysterious. There's gonna be there's gonna be a, a dry ice machine creating fog, sure. that sort of thing. There's gonna be some smoke. There's gonna be some smoke. fake smoke. Fake smoke. Uh, Rocky Horror Show. If you don't feel like finding a theater that's showing it and doing all the crazy things and throwing the screen, there's a uh, stage play. Um, there's Little Shop of Horrors. There's going to be two productions of that, and I'm, I'm checking here. Millennial Theater is one, and Blank Canvas is another. So we've got two of those. Young Frankenstein, there's two of those uh, up in Ashtabula, and then the other one is in Willoughby. And again, Young Frankenstein. Now this, you know, it gets, it gets scary. That's not a scary movie per se. It's 50 years old, if people can believe that. But it's been adapted into something that's got the Halloween feel, the Halloween sure. theme. And who doesn't like Young Frankenstein? It's interesting to see. We're not going to get a stage play with Gene Wilder in it because he's no longer with us. So now you've got two productions. You can go check out one of those. So that really adds to kind of this list of musicals and f- film adaptations that seem to be uh, yeah. offered this season. Sure. And, and you could say, well, I could just watch the film again at home if Aww. I feel like it. You could say that. But uh, it's more fun to go see like the Sunshine Boys is going to. That was a play that became a film and is now uh, they're doing the play here. So people a lot of times in these cases might not realize there is a play that this film was based on. But we all remember the film, you know, of course. Um, Sound of Music. People remember Julie Andrews much better than any of the stage plays. Uh, was that originally a, a musical? That was on stage, yeah. That's so right. that's that's how, yeah, that's how they did that. And uh, it was, of course, a blockbuster musical. Of uh, course. Before it was on stage, it was uh, pretty much a real life thing. And I have to give a shout out because uh, one of the Von Trapp children in her old age lived in the same building as my uncle. And one time I was in the elevator with her. Wow. That's my brush with fame wow that and meeting Ringo Starr so well those you know it's pretty equal oh I don't know your Ringo we'll have to talk about it after the show next week is Ringo Starr okay great so (laughs) there's a a lot of adaptations out there I love that so let's talk about um Playhouse Square Yes. They have something very interesting happening. Tell me more about that. Okay, so there's, of course, the Playhouse Square uh, Broadway series that we have here uh, that goes throughout the season. They have the Akron series that I that I mentioned. Uh, and then they have Velveteen, which is uh, more for kids, as you could guess from the, uh, from the, the title. And uh, it's something that they've commissioned. I'm going to be doing a story on this, so I'll be having more details for people, and, and they can find out more about Velveteen. Yeah, so the Velveteen it. Rabbit, uh, yes. if you want to know my connection to that, I mm. had a, uh, I think it was an album. Mm, okay. Uh, Meryl Streep narrated. Oh, yeah, with the white cover mm-hmm. and the little, yeah. And Dave Winston played the piano. Yes, yeah, yeah. And it was beautiful, and and it, it it's such a vivid memory for me, listening to that album and listening to her tell the Velveteen Rabbit yeah. story. Uh, it, it really pulls on my heartstrings, even to talk about I know, <laughs> see? Most people our age, I think that's probably was their introduction, because... Mm-hmm. This was at a time when maybe we couldn't read yet. We just weren't old enough to read yet, but we could put on, have somebody put on a record album for us and, and listen to it. And her voice was perfect for that. The music oh. set the stage perfectly. I can like hear it in my head now as you talk about it. So, um, yeah, now people... Like, I want to be real. <laughs> right, yeah. We can take our kids now yeah. and they can see it on stage. So, in addition to that... Mm-hmm. Are there other productions that you think are kind of family friendly oh, that yeah. might be fun for the whole family to go to or families with younger kids? So some of them, even even not maybe too young, but even something like I mentioned, Young Frankenstein might be might be okay for them. But ones that are specifically for kids or by kids, there's there's several here. And I'm looking at the list. There's uh, Tuck Everlasting, Mary Poppins. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, Peter Wendy, which is going to be at oh, Obama, nice. and I think w- I saw that with my kids maybe five, six years ago. I think at Obama, and it's amazing because if you, people can picture the space, it's basically a big cube. You're right there. You're inches from where hmm. the action is happening. The stage is is. And there's only a few uh, rows of seats, at least when I when we were there for that. So that was pretty amazing. But um, there's also several. There's Susicle, by the way. I, I forgot to to mention that. But there's several that are, as I say, by kids. Uh, Hades Town, Teen Edition. There's a school edition of Les Miserables. Nice. Six, the musical, Teen Edition. Um, and then Polka Dots, the cool kids musical. That's at Tailspinner uh, here, right here in Cleveland. So you have many choices. Maybe your child will go and see one of these and say, oh, I want to do that in the future. And then you can 
afterwards pick up a brochure in the lobby and suddenly your child is going to be in one of these maybe a year or two from now. All right, let's talk about plays that might be more geared towards adults, especially as we think about the upcoming November election. And so there's a, a, a handful of political plays? There's a handful. Uh, these are the scary ones to me. For, <laughs> forget the Halloween plays. These are the scary ones. So Super spooky. These are super spooky. As it, super, super spooky. So uh, also at Obama, they have POTUS, or behind every great... Uh, individual. I, I, I don't know if I can say the title on the air, but anyway, you can look it up. There, there, it's, it's about the women trying to keep the president alive, essentially. I'll put it that way. Interesting. That's going to be... I'm like trying to guess what that title is, but I no, can't people for the life See, I shouldn't have said that. I should have just said POTUS and left it at that. <laughs> you know what? We're gonna, we'll edit this before it goes out on the air, right? Uh, what the Constitution means to me, that's a Cleveland Playhouse. Oh, nice. Right here. So that's going to be pretty exciting. Uh, and I found out about this just happened right as we made this list, which, by the way, is online. Anyone who's interested, ideastream.org. Right as we made this, I found out about not-for-profit, the equity, diversity, and inclusion play. Now, that's not politics per se, but it's definitely an issue that of course. keeps coming up and everybody keeps talking about and disagreeing about and whatnot. Uh, and then Twin Masks over in Twinsburg, they have the Revolutionists, which is not, again, about modern politics, but you can definitely see parallels. Of course. Yeah, uh, sense parallels. We're always learning from history. Yes, true. Well, this is robust and exciting to think about. Uh, yeah. Makes me kind of want to go see some productions. True. So remind them more specifically, you mentioned the website, yes. but what, so it's, they just type in ideastream.org. Mm-hmm. Fall theater guide. Look for the cool photo of a stage that's about to be enveloped in in stories, and you'll see that it's. I think it's on the homepage. I just put it on my Facebook. I'll tweet it out later. Um, but there's a lot that that's listed there. You'll be able to find pretty much something. Uh, the, the cliche, something for everybody, as they say. Um, and there's even. Well, go, oh, you go ahead. You had, no, I was just going to ask. You 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 always put together these amazing lists, and I know you can't see all of these productions. No. But do you think you'll see one or two or oh, a couple? Oh, I'm sure. Because I, you know, in our house we have the uh, season for Playhouse Square. We have that. Okay. Um, I have a lot of friends who are in the theater scene, so they might invite me to something. That's great. Um, and we live in Hudson. There's the Hudson players. They're doing, I think, the Music Man, and then just down the road in Stowe, something that's completely out of left field to that, God of Carnage. So if you're, if anyone's familiar with that, what's that? That is about uh, two couples get together, and there's a, let's say, a cultural divide because their kids, there was a, a spat with their kids, and you know, when that happens, you get together with the other set of parents, try to talk things out. Well, in this case, things things get a little interesting and out of hand and dramatic. Um, which is not at all how you would describe the music man. So right. if you're down in Summit County, those are two things you could see, dueling productions that are very different. And 30 seconds for this answer. Any, mm-hmm. any other stories, big stories you're working out? You mentioned yeah. Velveteen. Velveteen. I can't wait to hear that behind the scenes. That's coming up. The cigarette tax uh, is coming sure. up next month before early voting starts, which people, you can still register to vote. Before early voting starts in October, we will have a story about the uh, Cuyahoga County cigarette tax, which funds the arts. And we know a lot of people are interested in that topic. Mm-hmm. So Kabir Bhatti, a senior arts and culture reporter here at Ideastream. Always great to have you. Thanks Always for having great- me. That wraps it up for us. To get the last word on today's topic, send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter now X at Sound of Ideas. You can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore or on Instagram at Jenny Hamill Ideastream. Looking ahead to all the great stuff that's coming up on the Sound of Ideas this week. Tomorrow, Marlene Harris-Taylor is in the host chair for a discussion about men's health, why men tend to put off going to the doctor, and what some area hospitals are doing to make sure that men feel comfortable scheduling the checkups they need to get the health care they need. Wednesday, I'll be back in the host chair. We'll answer all your voting questions with Jen Miller from the League of Women Voters of Ohio. And Thursday, LeVar Burton, the beloved figure from Roots, Star Trek, and the Reading Rainbow will be on the program, as well as former Ohio Department of Health Director Amy Acton. It's going to be a big show. You won't want to miss that. If you miss any portion of the program, find us online or listen to the Sound of Ideas podcast where you get your podcasts. You can also hear a rebroadcast tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak with you again on Wednesday.
The Sound of Ideas is produced by Rachel Rood, Lee Barr, Drew Mazius, and Aya Cathy, with technical assistance from Chris Dudley and Samson Auble. Jane Nungesser and Yigal Kaufman are at the controls of the Ohio Channel broadcast, and our host is Jenny Hamill. Thanks for listening. You're listening to 89.7 WKSU Kent, a public media service licensed to Kent State University and operated by IdeaStream Public Media.